Mesdames et Messieurs, Dames et Heren, Ladies and Gentlemen, it is a great honor and pleasure to welcome you all here on the occasion of the commemoration of the death of Edith Cavell 100 years ago. C'est un grand honneur et plaisir de pouvoir vous accueillir ici à l'occasion de la commémoration de la mort d'Edith Cavell il y a 100 ans. Het is een grote eer en genoegen u te mogen verwelkomen voor de herdenking van de dood van Edith Cavell in 100 jaar geleden. Before anything else, let me start with some practical details. Simultaneous interpretation is available through the headphones for English Press 3. May we also ask you to switch off your mobile phones and remind you that photography is not permitted in the hemicycle. Tout d'abord, une remarque pratique. Une interprétation simultanée est disponible. Pour le français, veuillez sélectionner le 1. N'oubliez pas d'éteindre vos GSM. Il n'est pas permis de prendre des photos dans l'hémicycle. Erst an vooral, give you crack what practice in pharmacy may. Er is simultan vertaling beschikbaar voor het Nederlands kies u kanaal 2. Gelief uw GSM af te zetten en geen foto's te nemen in het halfrond. Nou, may I invite Andrew Brown, the chairman of the Belgian Edith Cavell Commemoration Group, to take the floor. Good morning, everyone. It has been a challenging and but hugely satisfying journey to bring the memories of Edith Cavill, Philip Boak, and others to the Senate this morning. The Belgian Edith Cavill Commemoration Group was established some five years ago with the objective of reminding people in Brussels and Belgium of the extraordinary stories that surrounded the so-called Cavill Network. We are a group of admirers from the UK, Belgium, and Germany, all with an ambition to commemorate the work and acts of some exceptional human beings, very often in and around Brussels, where many of us live today in peace. We are honored that the Senate and the British Embassy have made this commemoration event possible this morning. From the outset, I ensured that our efforts would be in the spirit of reconciliation. We have organized a series of events in this, the centenary year of the deaths of Edith Cavill and Philippe Boak. This summer past, a set of 14 paintings, the Edith Cavill Passion, was exhibited in the Saint-Michel and Goudou Cathedral. An exhibition tracing Edith Cavill's life opened last Friday at the Doyenne Maison des Arts in Oucle, and it will stay open until the end of this month. Last Saturday, a commemoration concert was held at the Pro, at the Pro Cathedral of Holy Trinity, which included the first performance of David Mitchell's newly composed Cavill Mass. Yesterday, a special memorial service was held also at Holy Trinity, and this morning, a new bust by Belgian artist Nathalie Lambert was unveiled in Oucle. Later this month uh, at the Oucle Cultural Centre, Cinematheque will present the recently restored 1928 film of Edith Cavill's life entitled Dawn. I'm also delighted that in November the Edith Cavill exhibition will be shown in the European Parliament and in January the Etterbeek Commune will present it. We have also organized a schools program for the exhibition. To date, more than 20 class visits have been reserved, which I understand with more to come. Over the last three years, we have been invited to speak at numerous conferences, 
and meetings throughout Belgium to present the Edith Cavill story, and we have presented to the media at some length. I am therefore duly satisfied that in this way the memories of Edith Cavill, Philip Bock and others will have been well remembered, especially by some of the younger generation. I owe thanks to many individuals, too many to name here this morning, and some very important institutions. Most of the doors we knocked on opened. The Senate, the British Embassy, the Uccle Commune, the Edith Cavill Clinic, Cinematheque, Holy Trinity Pro Cathedral, and the Saint Michel and Godot Cathedral, as well as the Brussels region, Brussels Capital Region, that has importantly provided crucial financial support for our activities. The German Embassy has also been of great support and encouragement. We are indeed privileged to come together at this historical moment to remember and reflect on the stories of Edith Cavill, Philip Boak, and some 178 other individuals across Belgium and northern France who constituted the informal Cavill network. It is important to note that in our midst today, there are several descendants of a few of these individuals, namely of Edith Cavill, Philippe Boak, Herman Capio, and Georges Hostelet. Also present are descendants of the, the Francois family, where Edith Cavill worked as a governess in Brussels around 1895, and of Antoine de Page, who invited Edith Cavill to Belgium in 1907 to open a nursing school. His wife, Marie de Page, was killed in the attack on the Lusitania in May 1915, and she and Edith are jointly remembered on a memorial at the corner of Rue Edith Cavell and Rue Marie de Page. At the end of the First World War, King Albert posthumously, posthumously awarded Edith Cavill the Cross of the Order of Leopold. The Belgian government awarded her the Croix Civique, and France awarded her the Légion d'Honneur. The British took her home. In 1919, Edith Cavill's mortal remains were returned to her hometown in Norwich, where she rests to this day in the garden of the magnificent cathedral there. Those we are commemorating today were people who, before the hostilities of 1914-18, were going through about their daily business unknown and unobserved. The adversity that they encountered catapulted them into actions that they could never have foreseen. The French President's commemoration speak at the Pantheon earlier this year included these words. Ils étaient admirables sans avoir voulu être admirés, reconnus sans avoir cherché à être connus, célébrés sans avoir imaginé être célèbres. Appropriate words indeed for Edith Cavill, Philip Boak, and the others remembered here in this hemicycle by these two plaques behind me. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brown. Our next speaker is Ms. Diana Tsuhami, who recently published a biography of Mrs. Edith Cavell. Ms. Tsuhami, please take the floor. This very day, a hundred years ago, at dawn on Tuesday, the 12th of October, 1915, Edith Cavill was taken from cell 23 in Saint-Gilles prison to the Tier National and shot by the occupying German army. Four days previously, she'd been sentenced here in this Senate by a military court. Her crime was that she had helped Allied soldiers, British, French and Belgian, escape to freedom across the Dutch border. 
She hadn't set out to be a resistance worker. She was a nurse. For eight years, she'd been working in Brussels as founding matron of the country's first professional training school for nurses. She was 49 when she died, slight in build, straight back, five foot three, gray eyes, soft spoken, and always concerned for others, whatever the danger and consequence to herself. She was caring in small things too, when a dubious looking stray dog turned up at the back door of the nursing school, she fed him and let him stay. Jack the dog's now stuffed in the Imperial War Museum. Every Christmas she threw an all-day party for deprived children, and even in 1914 she managed roast beef and plum pudding for them. At the outbreak of war, she flew the Red Cross flag over the school and reminded her nurses that any wounded man, whatever his uniform, must be treated equally. On the 1st of November 1914, two English soldiers, one of them wounded, both separated from their regiments at Mons on the 23rd of August, the first involvement in battle of British troops, and in hiding from then on, were brought after dark to her school by resistance workers. She nursed and sheltered these soldiers, then found guides to get them to Holland. After that, her involvement escalated. Nothing in Edith Cavill's upbringing or background prepared her for the havoc and carnage of the First World War. She was born in 1865 in the village of Swardston in Norfolk into tranquil, time-honored English rural life. Her father was the vicar, and she was imbued from the cradle with her sense of duty toward those in need. Professions weren't open to women, and from 1887 until 1895, she was a governess, an occupation often disparaged in 19th century literature. But five of those years were in Brussels as governess to the Francois family. Paul Francois was a Belgian lawyer, and there were four children, so she became fluent in French. She spoke it with an unremittingly English accent, and she got to know the city. Being a governess is only temporary. I'm going to do something useful, something for people, she wrote in 1895 to her cousin Edward. And that year she started her training at the flagship London Hospital. She worked for a decade in Britain in all branches of nursing and then was invited in 1907 by the Belgian surgeon Dr. Antoine de Page to set up and run his pioneering training school. Five years later, he told the International Congress of Nurses that the school had become the benchmark for nursing standards in Belgium. War curtailed Edith Cavill's chosen work and turned her into a subversive. She was honored at its end, her body exhumed in 1919, a state funeral in Westminster Abbey, monuments raised, schools and hospitals given her name. Tributes then were to the saintly nurse caught in the man's world of war. Commemoration now brings a reappraisal. Condescension about gender has gone. Edith Cavill is honored as a pioneering matron and an intrepid resistance worker, motivated in all she did by her vocation to alleviate suffering. A woman whose whole allegiance was to saving life, not taking it. Thank you very much, Ms. Suemi. Nous avons maintenant le plaisir d'écouter un intermède musical par le Chamber Choir and Flute Ensemble of the British School of Brussels. The Bregen Hans London derrière, Intermezzo Oit Cavalleria Rusticana and Eileen Rune.
Ladies and gentlemen, may I ask you to stand up? Mesdames, Messieurs, puis-je vous demander de vous lever? Dames et Heren, magie que vragen recte staan. We welcome Her Royal Highness Princess Astrid, Her Royal Highness the Princess Royal, and her husband, Vice Admiral Sir Tim Lawrence. Please be seated. J'invite Madame Christine de Freyne, présidente du Sénat, à prendre la parole. Krag, nous dégigne me voir Christine de Freyne, voorzitter van de Sénat, uit om het woord te nemen. Your Royal Highnesses, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to welcome you all to this, to the debating chamber of the Senate, and I would like particularly to welcome Her Royal Highness Princess Astrid and Her Royal Highness the Princess Royal Anne of Great Britain, and of course, Admiral Lawrence. I also wish to welcome the representatives and members of the Belgian Edith Cavell Commemoration Group, in particular its chairman, Mr. Andrew Brown. BECG, fortunately the association is much more pleasant than its acronym, has been very active in perpetuating the memory of the person that we are honoring today in so many different ways in our country. Of course, I express particular gratitude to the British Ambassador, Mrs. Alison Rose, and her predecessor, Mr. Jonathan Brenton, who have supported these initiatives from the outset and have overseen meticulously the coordination of the series of events which compose this exceptional day of tributes. It is an honor to have you among us for this event, which celebrates an heroine who was British by birth and Belgian in her heart, present in the collective memory of our two countries, to the point of being a household word for many of our fellow citizens. Edith Cavell also personifies the intensity of Britain's involvement in our fight against the occupiers. 
We are now in the very place where the trial of Edith Cavell was held as we commemorate her death. During the First World War, the occupying forces used this debating chamber as a military court. Hundreds of civilians were judged here by German soldiers for acts deemed hostile to the German authorities. A free defense committee for Belgium before the German courts defended prisoners free of charge. Several members of parliament, lawyers by profession and able to speak German, played a leading role in that work. However, their room of maneuver was limited because we knew that, we know that, for example, the lawyers did not always have the opportunity to meet the accused before their trial. The commemorative plaques on either side of the desk mention the names of the 35 citizens who were sentenced to death and then executed. Many others were given long sentences and were deported to Germany. Some were given heavy fines, others were acquitted. The commemorative plaques appear small in comparison with the spacious room, yet they are of enormous symbolic importance because they remind us day after day that these heroes put their lives on the line to preserve the lives and liberty of others. Fortunately, this hemicycle has regained its role as a parliamentary chamber the senators hold their plenary sessions here, and symposia, commemoration, and celebration are regularly held. We have gathered today, 100 years after her death, to pay tribute to Edith Cavers and thank the United Kingdom for the great sacrifices that it made for the liberation of a country. The ceremony will continue in two parts. The commemoration itself will be followed by some reflection about topical aspect of nursing. Edith Cavell entered our joint history as a war heroine, but above all, she was a nurse. And it was in that capacity that she wanted to be remembered. Being a nurse in Edith Cavell's day, but these days too, is to give of oneself day after day. Nursing has obviously evolved in a hundred years, but the nurse remains the prime contact for the patient. The nurse is more than a person who administers care. It is a person who reassures and who listens. Edith Cavell was able to give of herself by choosing nursing as a, her profession, as well as teaching it to the other young women who came after her. She did not settle for just caring for patients, but also contributed to giving about 200 soldiers their freedom. She believed that she was doing her dirty and her courage, but set us an example, an example and inspired us for the future. When Edith Cavell was arrested, a whole network was dismantled. Edith Cavell is, in a way, one of the symbols of that network. She played an important role in it and paid for it with her life. In commemorating her death, we are commemorating all those people who participated to a greater or lesser extent in that network to save the lives of the soldier that helped to escape. Those people, many of them Belgium, risked or sacrificed their life as Edith Cavell did. Edith Cavell gives them a voice and a face, and we are thinking of every one of them on a day like today. A hundred years after her death, Edith Cavell continues to play a major role. Unfortunately, War is still a topical theme. We only have to switch on television to understand that, but
but it's important that people understand that war is devastating consequences and it's just not something that happens in faraway, distant lands. The current international context and the resulting wave of refugees prove them yet, that yet again. The Senate is working actively to raise public awareness of this issue. To do that, the Senate is addressing its efforts mainly at children and young people. Since guided tours are organized, children play an important role in the activities of Armistice Day. There is a leaflet devoted to the Parliament and to the First World War. In addition, the Senate is also working on routine education of citizens via various projects. The Senate wants to make its contribution to encouraging children to develop into good citizens with knowledge of the democracy and the history of their country. The commemoration in the context of the First World War offer an additional opportunity to do that and the Senate wishes to use it fully. As President of the Senate, I can but encourage activities like today. First of all, the heroism and the personality of Edith Cavell deserves to be honored for her heroic action, but also because it enables us to keep alive the memory of that sad episode in our history and learn lessons from it. I thank you all for your presence, in particular Her Royal Highness Princess Astrid of Belgium and Royal Highness Princess Royal Anne of Great Britain. And to conclude, I cannot resist quoting King Albert I's speech to both House of Parliament on the 22nd November 1918, and you have seen the tapestry in uh, the room beside. I have another duty to fulfill, to command the fin fine military virtues of the Allied troops who fought on Belgian soil, fighting alongside our own, all driven by the same ideals and the same spirit of sacrifice. Let us salute the soldiers of France, Britain, and the United States who came to lend us their aid. I bow my head respectfully to those who died and who lie buried in our sacred soil. Belgium will steadfastly uphold their glorious memory. Now, Her Royal Highness Princess Astrid will speak, and you have the floor. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Madame la Présidente. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I'm so pleased by the presence in Brussels of Princess Anne, as we are gathering here to honor Edith Cavell, a great British patriot who worked and died in Belgium. Edith Cavell's name is familiar to Britons and Belgians alike. As a war hero and a martyr, Miss Cavell deserves our admiration, our respect, and our profound gratitude. It is very moving to stand here with you in this building of the Belgian Senate, exactly at the very same spot where 100 years ago the trial took place. Miss Cavell stood bravely by her convictions. It was here that her death sentence was pronounced by the German court martial. She was then a woman of about my age. The name of Edith Cavell lives on in many ways. In Brussels, she has a statue. A street is named after her and, of course, a hospital with a famous nurses' training school. In London, her statue stands in Stravagal Square. In Paris, Tuileries, there is a sculpture. 
A glacier is named after her in the American Rocky Mountains and in Canada, there is a mountain with her name. A strange coincidence in my calendar makes me travel in next week to Canada, not far from Mont Cavell. Her straightforward courage and her professional devotion are inspiring examples for today's and tomorrow's generations. Belgium is grateful to her. The world is grateful to her. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you all for joining Princess Anne and me for today's ceremony and for your support to make it possible. It is indeed very appropriate to commemorate Edith Cavell here in the Senate's hemicycle with a lasting eternal reference. We have to keep her legacy alive for the next centennials to come. We will never forget her. Thank you. Merci, Madame. Thank you, Mevrouw. May I invite Ms. Diana Suemi to take the floor again. The 7th of October 1915 was the day of Edith Cavill's trial. There were 35 accused, 22 men and 13 women. They were driven from Saint-Gilles prison to Parliament House and herded up the grand staircase to hear the Senate. Edith Cavill came from 10 weeks of solitary confinement in a whitewashed cell to every emblem of grandeur in this 18th century monument to civic pride in justice and the rule of law. The gold cupola, marble columns, oak panelling inlaid with the crowns, wreaths and swords of monarchy, justice, nationhood, life-size paintings of Belgian rulers from Pepin de Herstel to down to Charles of Lorraine. She might almost have been diverted by the mural of the Battle of Waterloo. She was a good artist, and when a governess in Belgium on holiday with her charges, she painted a watercolour of the farm at Hougoumont, Wellington's vital garrison. The six main defendants, Edith Cavill, Marie de Croix, Jeanne de Belleville, Louise Toulier, Hermann Capiau, and Philippe Bouc, were seated facing the uniformed, bemedaled judges. Their backs were to lawyers whom they hadn't met, soldiers with fixed bayonets, stood on either side of each seat. The accused were variously charged with having conveyed soldiers to the enemy or assisting with such conveyance, circulating seditious pamphlets, assisting in the illegal transmission of letters, concealing arms, or evading compulsory registration. Edouard Stober, the prosecutor, opened proceedings by reading the charges. Lieutenant Bergen, head of espionage, then made a long deposition. All this was in German, which not many of the accused understood. The core of the prosecution was paragraph 90 of the German military penal code, which defined as treason crimes against the fatherland, including conducting soldiers to the enemy. The accused were then sent out and brought in singly to be tried. Edith Cavill was first. Questions were in German, then translated by a police officer into French. Answers were in French, then translated into German. The lawyer, Sadi Kirschen, later wrote that Edith Cavill's French was fluent, though her English accent strong. She spoke in a low voice and appeared proud and calm and unafraid. Stober put it to her that from November 1914 to July 1915, she harbored French and English soldiers 
including a colonel, all in civilian clothes, that she helped give Belgians, French and English of military age the means to get to the front by taking them into her clinic and by giving them money. Yes, Edith Cavill agreed. With whom did you collaborate in doing this? With Monsieur Capillard, Mademoiselle Toulier, Monsieur de Devaux, and Monsieur Libier? Who was the head of this organization? There was no head. Was it not the Prince de Croix? Unlike the others, de Croix had avoided arrest, so she tried not to implicate him. No, the Prince only sent men to us and gave some of them a little money. Why have you committed the acts of which you are accused? At the start, I was confronted by two English soldiers whose lives were in danger. One was wounded. Stober told her martial law didn't carry the death penalty in the event of soldiers being captured. Edith Cavill replied, it was her belief and theirs that if she did not help them, they would be shot. Do you realize that by recruiting men, it has been to the disadvantage of Germany and to the advantage of the enemy? My aim was not to help your enemy, but to help those men who asked for my help to reach the frontier. Once across the frontier, they were free. How many men have you helped get to the frontier? About 200. She was asked if some of the men she helped were French and Belgian. She said they were. That was all, no more than 10 minutes of questioning, for there were 34 other men and women to dispose of in the day. Thank you, Ms. Suami. À présent, Madame Sophie Creusot, descendante de la sœur d'Edith Cavell, nous fera lecture du texte original de la dernière lettre d'Edith Cavell. Edith Cavell's last letter was in, written in French, so I will be reading it in French. Mes chers nurses, c'est un moment très triste pour moi quand je vous écris pour vous faire mes adieux. Il me fait rappeler que le 17 septembre a vu la fin des huit ans de ma direction de l'école. J'étais si heureuse d'être appelée à aider à l'organisation de l'œuvre que notre comité venait de fonder. Le 1er octobre de l'année 1907, il n'y avait que quatre jeunes élèves. Maintenant, vous êtes déjà nombreuses, en tout 50 à 60, je pense, en comptant celles qui sont diplômées et qui vont quitter l'école. Je vous ai raconté à diverses reprises ces premiers jours et les difficultés que nous avons rencontrées, jusque dans le choix des mots pour vos heures de service et hors service. Tout était nouveau dans la profession pour la Belgique. Peu à peu, un service après l'autre a été établi. Les infirmières pour soigner dans les maisons particulières, les infirmières scolaires, l'hôpital de Saint-Gilles. Nous avons desservi l'Institut du docteur Depage, le sanatorium de Buissaint-Jean, la clinique du docteur Maillère, et maintenant, beaucoup sont appelés, comme vous le serez peut-être plus tard, à soigner les braves blessés de guerre. Si cette dernière année, notre ouvrage a diminué, la cause se trouve dans le triste temps par lequel nous passons. Dans les jours meilleurs, notre œuvre reprendra sa croissance et toute sa puissance pour faire du bien. Si je vous parle du passé, c'est parce qu'il est bien, quelquefois, de s'arrêter pour contempler le chemin que nous avons traversé pour nous rendre compte de nos erreurs 
et de notre progrès. Dans votre belle maison, vous aurez plus de malades et vous aurez tout ce qu'il vous faut pour leur confort et pour le vôtre. À mon regret, je n'ai pas su toujours vous parler en particulier. Vous savez que j'ai eu assez d'occupations. Mais j'espère que vous n'oublierez pas nos causeries du soir. Je vous ai dit que le dévouement vous donnerait un vrai bonheur et la pensée que vous avez fait devant Dieu et devant vous-même, votre devoir entièrement et de bon cœur sera votre soutien dans les mauvais moments de la vie et en face de la mort. Il y a deux ou trois de vous qui se rappelleront les petites causeries que nous avons eues ensemble. Ne les oubliez pas. Étant déjà si loin dans la vie, j'ai pu voir, peut-être, plus clair que vous et vous montrer le droit chemin. Un mot encore. Méfiez-vous de la médisance. Puis-je vous dire, aimant votre pays de tout cœur, que c'est la grande faute ici. J'ai vu tant de malheurs depuis ces huit ans qu'on aurait pu éviter ou amoindrir si on n'avait pas soufflé un petit mot par-ci, par-là, peut-être sans mauvaise intention, et détruit ainsi le bonheur, même la vie de quelqu'un. Les nurses ont toutes besoin de penser à cela et de cultiver parmi elles la loyauté et l'esprit de corps. S'il y a une de vous qui a un grief contre moi, je vous prie de me pardonner. J'ai peut-être été quelquefois injuste, mais je vous ai aimé beaucoup plus que vous ne le croyez. Mes souhaits pour le bonheur de toutes mes jeunes filles, autant pour celles qui ont quitté l'école que pour celles qui s'y trouvent encore. Merci pour la gentillesse que vous m'avez toujours témoignée. Votre directrice, Edith Cavill, le 10 octobre 1915. Merci, Madame Cruzo. We now come to the moment of the laying of the rest into a new Miss Cavern and all those who, like her, lost their lives in the cause of her freedom. Son Altesse Royale, la Princesse Astrid, Her Royal Highness, the Princess Royal, ainsi que Madame Christine de Freyne, President du Sénat, déposeront une couronne. In the sun, Bring the chamber choir and flute ensemble of the British School of Brussels abide with me. A name the Edith Cavell, self gesungen heeft op de vooravond van haar executie. The hymn abide with me will be followed by two minutes silence. Mesdames et messieurs, je vous prie de bien vouloir vous lever, dames et heren, Magiku Vragen Rectostan, ladies and gentlemen, will you please stand up?
vous prie de bien vouloir observer deux minutes de silence. Please observe two minutes silence. Maki u vragen twee minuten stilte in acte te nemen. It is a great honor to invite Her Royal Highness the Princess Royal to address us. Madam President, Ministers, Mr. Mayor, Your Excellencies, Ladies and Gentlemen, it is an honor and a privilege to be here today to represent those in the Edith Cavill Trust. And it is a real pleasure to be present at this occasion. We are humbled and honored by the way in which you here in Belgium, particularly in Brussels and the Senate House, have honored Edith Cavell. We don't just honour Edith Cavell, and we remember, as you mentioned with these plaques, Philip Bork and those other 35 who were tried here, all courageous members of the Belgian Resistance Network, and that they were tried in this very room and ultimately paid the supreme sacrifice on behalf of others uh, makes this a very moving occasion for all of us. On the night before she died in a prison cell in St. Gilles, Edith Cavill met with the Anglican priest to take her last communion. As he bade farewell, the priest said, we will remember you as a heroine and as a martyr. Edith replied, don't think of me like that. Think of me as a nurse who tried to do her duty. Perhaps she was remembering the words of Florence Nightingale, who introduced the concept of modern nursing to the United Kingdom, as Cavill helped to do in Belgium. Florence Nightingale said, I'm certainly convinced that the greatest heroes are those who do their duty in the daily grind, whilst the world whirls like a mad spinning top. Actually, quite a modern terminology. Both Nightingale and Cavill were too modest. In reality, they were pioneers. Both bravely tackled prejudice and suspicion to establish nursing as a respected profession. After all, it was neither reputable nor a profession uh, before they started. Both overcame low expectations about what, what women could and should achieve. 
and both took physical risks with their own lives. As president of Save the Children, I have witnessed nurses and health workers doing the same in conflict zones, in aftermath of disasters, and in raising standards of children's health all over the world. I'm sure if they realized it, uh, they had been equally inspired by Edith Cavill and Florence Nightingale. As we just heard, Edith Cavill's final letter to her nurses shows her concern for their well-being. Nurses and healthcare workers need our support and encouragement. And we remember today that as a direct result of Edith Cavill's execution, that the, the Cavill Nurses Trust came into being, and that that appeal was the response of both the British nation and others to what to them was a remarkably shocking event. And they realized then that the support that would be needed for nurses as a direct result of what they were doing but it is still just as relevant today as we help nurses and healthcare workers who face hardship. The Cavill Nurses Trust also provides scholarships to recognize and encourage trainee nurses and healthcare workers. And in this instance, I'm gonna particularly like to thank Secretary the Belgian Ambassador in, in the United Kingdom and their embassy in London for their support for these scholarships. And as we will shortly hear from one of their scholars who can probably describe better what it means to them as individuals. I do believe that this is a real way forward to remember uh, Edith Cavell, her commitment, and her investment in nurse training and her understanding of their values for the future. I'm delighted too that there are nurses here in the Senate this morning, and I will be visiting Queen Fabiola University Children's Hospital this afternoon to meet more of nurses and trainee nurses and see some of the continuing pioneering work in training in child health. I hope and I sincerely believe that the example of Edith Cavill will inspire future generations of doctors, nurses and healthcare workers as they develop new ways of working and as they continue to work in dangerous or challenging situations. And I can think of no better way of ending than to quote the inscription on the imposing Edith Cavill statue in Trafalgar Square in London. She said, Patriotism is not enough. I must have no hatred or bitterness for anyone. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. I have the pleasure to invite Ms. Sarah Louise Flowers, a scholar of the Edith Cavell Nurses Trust, to take the floor. Good morning, and, and thank you very much for having me. I'm Sarah Louise, I'm one of the Cavell Scholars, and I'm now currently nursing at St. Thomas's Hospital in London. Today we've heard so much about Edith Cavell's inspiring life and her past, but what I'm hoping to show today is how her legacy still lives on to inspire future nurses and to push the boundaries in how these nurses today are, are finding new solutions to contemporary healthcare problems. So what did I do? Thanks to the opportunity offered to me by the Cavill Trust, I spent four months working affiliated with the Adolfo Guevara Hospital in Peru. I worked on outreach projects and isolated clinics in the communities, working with a variety of different problems, but in particular I was looking at the impact of mining on the local populations and how the water was being contaminated and how this in turn was affecting the life of people in these areas. Inspired by Edith Cavill and her political as well as clinical concerns for her patients, I wanted to explore the holistic elements of care that surrounded these physical needs. This includes the social, the personal, the spiritual, and the too often ignored political element of care, particularly the provision of dignity and voice. So in this case, I was looking at the voice of those who often ignored in these areas in Peru, in these mining towns. 
I strongly believe that nursing is a vehicle to navigate people through their health concerns via the means of patient empowerment. This can be achieved by allowing their voice to be heard and for dignity to be promoted, as well as, of course, meeting their physical needs. Nurses then should act as advocates and create a bridge between those who are experiencing illness and those who are diagnosing the disease. Nurses have the privilege of pertaining to both spheres and of having the opportunity to begin to understand these patient perspectives, thus laying down the blocks for effective and compassionate care. Uh, a good example of this, I believe, is a lady who I met when I was working out there who was too afraid to take her medication and her tablets because she didn't understand what they were for. And she thought that the side effects she was having from the medication was the doctors trying to poison her. So once we had a, a discussion and a chat about this, we got her local shaman to bless the tablets and for her local priest also to bless the tablets. And then she was happy to take them because we understood this from her perspective and looking at her needs as well as our own. By going to Peru, I hope to illustrate how the role of nursing can be developed to better reflect the needs of those it's meant to represent. This is not only something of global significance, but is also pertinent in the UK and Belgium today. What with the promotion of the six C's, so this is care, compassion, competence, courage, commitment and communication, so demonstrating that patient-centred care and compassion have been the focus or have become the focus of healthcare today, However, this isn't to say that these priorities are new. We only have to turn to Edith Cavill to be reminded of such compassion and commitment for the cause of her patients, to see that despite the new packaging, the six C's have been the foundation of healthcare and nursing for over 100 years. It was with these core principles and the inspiration from such a formidable woman who challenged boundaries that I set out to take on an admittedly much more humble challenge of my own. How can a nurse and how can the nurse's role incorporate patient voice and promote dignity within restricted healthcare systems? My humble foray into these issues revealed not only the vast complexity of healthcare in these isolated regions, but it also emphasised the essential role of the nurse in securing a solution. Despite what may appear as a very political and perhaps abstract topic, that of mining, I believe that by involving the nurse in the research of both clinical but also the personal patient needs and their specific ideas, a, bri a bridge can be built between the clinical and the personal. A nurse then can play a role in gathering information by monitoring symptoms and recording data, which will be required to establish the problems in these areas. But at the same time, the nurse has the advantage of being able to speak to these people and to her patients or to their patients directly about their concerns and learn to understand that person's personal experience. By becoming an advocate for their patients, a nurse can push forward patient perspective so that a holistic, bottom-up understanding of their situation can be promoted when planning their care. This in turn will allow for the unheeded patient voice to be heard dignity to be promoted, and for efficient and acceptable solutions to be put into practice. By including the people who are affected in the planning of their health outcomes, a more successful and long-term solution can be put into place. I strongly believe that the nurse is the person to help make this happen. So what did I get out of all of this? So much, it's really hard to know where to begin. I had an amazing experience. I learnt new clinical, sk clinical skills. I got some um, brilliant research material. But most importantly, I believe, if we turn to Edith Cavill's story herself, I learnt the importance of leadership skills within nursing. I learnt how a holistic approach to care, which includes the social, the spiritual, the psychological, the political, as well as the clinical, is essential. And possibly most importantly of all, I learnt how a nurse should be an advocate for her patients. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Flowers. Graag doe ik ik de heer Jan Faubert, directeur van het verpleegkundig departement van het universitair kinderziekenhuis Koningin Fabiola, uit om aan het woord te nemen. Als kind was het voor mij reeds duidelijk dat ik verpleegkundige wou worden. Toen ik in 1986 afstudeerde als pediatrisch verpleegkundige, was ik heel blij om te kunnen starten in het Koningin Fabiola Kinderziekenhuis, 
het ziekenhuis dat net zijn deur had geopend en het enige ziekenhuis in België waar kinderen werden verzorgd. Ik startte mijn carrière op intensieve zorgen. Twee jaar later werd ik hoofdverpleegkundige van de dienst kinderoncologie. Nu, bijna dertig jaar later, ben ik nog steeds fier en blij om in het ziekenhuis te kunnen werken als directeur van het verpleegkundig departement. In de laatste dertig jaar is er veel veranderd, maar er zijn ook dingen die niet veranderd zijn. Verpleegkundige zijn was een roeping. Verpleegkunde is nu een beroep. Een beroep zoals een ander. De maatschappij verlangt van een verpleegkundige dat ze haar beroep met kunde en kennis uitvoert, bijdraagt tot de gezondheid van de bevolking en een bevolking verlangt een gezondheidszorg die toegankelijk is, maar die ook op een economisch verantwoorde manier omgaat met de middelen die ze krijgt. Het beroep van verpleegkundige zit in de lift. Sinds 2010 stijgt het aantal studenten elk jaar. Een belangrijke reden van deze stijging is de werkzekerheid. Een verpleegkundige vindt steeds werk. En in de komende jaren zullen er nog meer vraag zijn naar verpleegkundigen en andere gezondheidswerkers. Men schat dat in de Europese Unie tegen 2020... 1 à 2 miljoen gezondheidswerkers nodig zullen zijn. De afgelopen jaren heeft men veel te kampen gehad met tekorten en een groot aantal buitenlandse verpleegkundigen heeft zijn weg naar onze ziekenhuizen gevonden. Net zoals onze maatschappij is ons beroep dus ook multicultureel geworden. Zoals reeds eerder gezegd in deze zaal, een verpleegkundige staat... 24 uur lang in contact bij de patiënt, helpt de patiënt bij de vertaalslag, de noden, de diagnose, de behandeling en staat steeds in contact met andere gezondheidswerkers. De verpleegkundige heeft geen gemakkelijke positie. Ze staat tussen de patiënt, het ziekenhuis en de arts. Een positie die steeds moeilijk is geweest en die nog steeds moeilijk blijft. De voorbije jaren is verpleegkunde enorm geëvolueerd. Het aantal verpleegkundigen is gegroeid, de invulling van de job is geëvolueerd en verpleegkunde maakt nu deel uit van een dynamisch en veranderde gezondheidscontext. Een verpleegkundige die in een ziekenhuis terechtkomt, dient nog veel te leren, dient steeds verder getraind te worden en het inscholingsprogramma van verpleegkundigen is een continu proces. We kennen dat dan ook van het begrip lifelong learning. Een belangrijk deel van de tijd besteedt de verpleegkundige aan coaching, evaluatie, begeleiding van patiënten, familie en zorgverstrekkers. De verpleegkundige is een lid geworden van het multidisciplinaire team en de verpleegkundige is een partner geworden in de gezondheidszorg, niet enkel een uitvoerder. Zoals u wellicht weet, zal België tegen januari 2016 de opleiding verpleegkundige moeten hervormen. In de Europese context zal de opleiding gaan van drie naar vier jaar. En ik denk dat dit ook betekent dat wij als ziekenhuizen en het ganse systeem van gezondheidszorg zal moeten nadenken over de nieuwe invulling van de verpleegkundige. Uh, wanneer deze een studie van vier jaar zal gevolgd hebben. Men dient dus in de toekomst meer nadruk te leggen op functiedifferentiatie, meer kansen te geven aan verpleegkundigen om zich verder te ontwikkelen, onderzoek te integreren in de verpleegkundige praktijk. Verder dienen we rekening te houden met een aantal maatschappelijke evoluties, de vergrijzing van de bevolking, het toename van het aantal psychiatrische ziekten en de armoede die onze bevolking meer en meer treft. De toekomst van de verpleegkundige kan dus in principe alleen maar beter worden. Het beroep zit in de lift, het beroep is populair. Toch denk ik dat je dit beroep enkel kan blijven uitvoeren wanneer het beroep, 
het beroep graag doet, wanneer je de nodige passie hebt, de nodige reserve, een balans tussen privéleven en professioneel leven, omringd zijn door mensen die je steunen, die je graag hebben, zijn volgens mij de ingrediënten van een goede en lange carrière. Tot slot laten we onze patiënten niet vergeten. Onze patiënten verdienen de beste zorg, de beste omkadering en vooral een menselijke aanpak. Wij als verpleegkundigen zijn de beste partner voor onze patiënten. Ik dank u. Dank u, meneer Valbert. Her Royal Highness, Prinses Astrid, Her Royal Highness, the Princess Royal and Vice Admiral Sir Tim Lawrence will now leave the ceremony. Can you thank you again? Thank for your attendance. Your Royal Highnesses, thank you for your presence. May I ask the Vergadering Rector to stand? May I please? Will the assembly stand up? Pourriez vous vous lever, s'il vous plaît? Please be seated. We will be seated. Écoutons à présent Locus Iste. Les tours dans ce bracte de Red Chamber Choir et Flute Ensemble à la British School of Brussels. We now come to the end of this commemoration ceremony. You are invited to leave the Senate by the main exit and go directly to the British residence. 
you will find the cloakroom at the lower end of the grand staircase on your left. La cérémonie est maintenant terminée. Je vous invite à quitter le Sénat par la porte principale et à vous diriger ensuite vers la résidence britannique. Votre vestiaire vous attend au bas de l'escalier d'honneur à votre gauche. Deze plechtigheid loopt ten einde. Ik nodig u uit om het gebouw te verlaten via de hoofduitgang om u naar de Britse residentie te begeven. Beneden links aan de erotrap zal u de vestiaire vinden. Merci, dank u, dank u.